Still haven't got it all worked out 100% every time I go over it again. I, I learned something else. I've watched that tape probably so many times I've about stretched it out now because every time I go through it, I see things I never saw before. That's like reading your Bible. You can't just read it one time and think you got it all. You read it and every time you read it, it seems to be different. The more you get, the more you learn about it, the more you begin to understand that thing is so intricately put together that it has to be supernatural for it to come together the way it is. And so what I'm going to try to show you is just clear up before we go a little bit further with this thing and then get into all the mysteries and stuff. Uh, I want to, I shouldn't use and stuff, get into all of the mysteries and the other teachings that are there uh, that you understand a couple of things. In the Bible, baptism often refers to water, but often it doesn't refer to water. In the Bible, sometimes the Lord will refer to church, but it's not the Jew and Gentile in one body. In one place, in the book of Exodus, as I told you about, where he makes reference to it in Acts 7, it has to do with a called out assembly. They're called out of Egypt and they're headed to Canaan. It's a picture of the church today because it also has in it strangers and sojourners. But it's not a church with elders and with deacons and with trustees and with a pastor and all that. It's a tight picture of those things. So the other question that came up during the time of it since uh, Wednesday was about uh, people going to the lower part of the earth. And most people teach that that's hell, or the Catholics teach that that has to do with a place called purgatory where you burn your sins out, and then if somebody pays enough money to the Catholic church, they can move you from purgatory to heaven. Well, it don't work like that. But I can show you in the Bible that the people that teach that somebody went to the heart of the earth, they teach it as soul sleep. It's a true thing, not soul sleep, but people didn't go where you go. When you die, if you're saved, you're absent from the body and present with the Lord just like that. In the Old Testament, when they died, they couldn't be present with the Lord because He hadn't died on Calvary. So they had to have to go to another place. In the book of Revelation, during the tribulation period, they don't come up to heaven when they die. They lose their head, the martyr's crown is given to them, that kind of thing. Uh, they're white. Those are the ones that have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Jesus Christ that are there. Their souls are crying from under the altar. I'll show you if I get to it tonight, if not, to, if not in the morning. I mean, uh, uh, I'll show you tonight if I don't get to it this morning. But I'll show you that that's a literal altar under the temple in Jerusalem. It's not up in heaven. Now I realize this is not something that most people will teach in a Sunday school class or in a church that matter. They say it, it, it fosters too many questions. Well, what better way to learn? Amen. Instead of just coming and every time you come you just hear the same thing. Don't do it. Stop doing it. Quit doing it. Do more. Get more. Be more. You're never good enough. You never arise to the enough level. You know, right when you stop doing all these things, you think, I finally got it. Then the preacher moves the level up here. And then the next thing you know, he moves it. And you never can obtain it. You're running like a, you know, a dog with his tongue hanging out. And you can never quite get to wherever it is they're trying to get you to. All right. Well, I'm going to show you some things that are in the Bible that have nothing to do with don't touch, don't taste, and don't handle. And it'll give you some peace in your mind and your heart to know that you know more about the Bible than just those things. There's more in the Bible than just salvation. As a matter of fact, that whole Bible runs all the way through and has to do with kingdoms all the way through there. It has to do with thrones all the way through there. Everybody that has tried to take over the world, going all the way back to Alexander the Great, going back to Constantine to take over the then known world, are trying to become world rulers. And then the uh, Southern Baptists picked up on it, the regular Baptists and other people, and they tried to say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to fix it so good that then God's going to come and bless it with His presence. Well, man has consistently been a failure in that matter, Amen. including all the religions. Amen. The, the Roman Catholics went out and they went out in the, name of the, in the sign of the cross in the name of what they called Jesus Christ, and they went out there and slaughtered anybody that didn't believe like they did. That's called the Crusades. They did that in the name of Jesus. That's a historical fact. Yep. They actually still teach that in school. Yep. That's a historical fact. You blame the Muslims for doing what they did? Why the Roman Catholics did it first? Amen. You will go out and do what? Establish a kingdom. So then you have a man that comes up after Alexander the Great and you go through all the thing, Napoleon, he tries to take over the world and this and that and the other. You have Hitler that comes up and when Hitler comes up, you know what he wants to bring in? He wants to bring in the Fourth Reich, the 4,000 year millennial reign of Christ. And what he does is, is he comes in and he's going to be the God manifested there in the flesh himself and he's going to take over the world and he's going to eradicate the world of anybody that doesn't agree with him. Sounds like a lot of Baptists. 
you got a little stiff there. You think, well, we're right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah, you may be right, but it doesn't give you a right to impose it on somebody else. Amen. You still live in the land of the free and the home of the... Amen. I started to say brave. I don't know anymore. But you, live, you at least live in the land of the free anymore. And, and, and I, I appreciate the military and those kind of things and the police and all that. But you still have the right to choose. You don't have a right to choose for other people. Just because you learn certain things, that's why we put a double door back there so you can get your head through there. That doesn't give you a right to impose that thought on somebody else or to look down upon them because they don't think like you do. Allow them to think freely. See, preacher, what do you think about people that read other material and stuff? I encourage you to read. Read something other than the Bible. Now read the Bible, but read. I mean read a lot. You say, why? Vociferously is a great word to use there. Read vociferously. Just tear it apart. Just, just devour it. But see, you don't read. You watch images all the time and you listen, to, you listen to commentary and people talking, 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 talking. You don't read. To read, you have to disengage your other senses and use your head for something besides a hat rack. That's why God didn't give it to you in picture form. He gave it to you in words. You say, why? Because with the right words, you'll produce the right pictures. Amen. So when it comes to this thing here, Hitler comes along there and he destroys 6 million Jews. Uh, Stalin, somewhere around 9 million Jews. But a whole bunch of Jews trying to eradicate them and trying to bring in the kingdom. Well, it faltered and it failed. Now what you may not know about history, because men never study history, and that's one thing we've learned about history, is men don't learn from history. But in history, when you finished World War II, you should have been on top of everything. You had 50% of the gold reserves, and 50% of the exports came from your nation. Your nation was as wealthy as it ever been. You wound up taking over the, the economy of Japan over there that you dropped bombs on, and then went back over to rebuild it so you could take over their, their economy. You did the same thing for Russia, who lost uh, uh, 270 million men in that battle. In the, in the war. That's just troops that they lost, not counting all the other people. You lost under 500,000. I'm not making light of the losses. I'm saying if you study history, you'll find out those things. You were trying to take over the world. FDR and Truman and New Deals and all this other kind of stuff that came up. You were trying to run the world's economy. Right after the World War II came along, you had the World Bank Federation that was formulated to take over the world banking system so you could control the finances in all the nations. Well, what happened to all the gold? You gave it away instead of using it for your country. You say, what was it for to take over? Now what's going to happen? You're going to have a final dictator that's going to rise up. That dictator will be called the Antichrist. He'll come in and obtain the kingdoms, the kingdoms, the kingdoms, the kingdoms with peace and flatteries. You say, why? That's the only thing that works nowadays is some smooth-talking, braying donkey that comes in and tells everybody and with a nice smile on their face and looks very passive and very easygoing and then cuts your throat behind the scenes where nobody can see you and stab you in the back. Because that's what people are looking for now. Is, you know, he doesn't like me because he raised his voice. You're very tender-footed that way. And so that guy will come in and he'll obtain the kingdoms. By the way, you'll be gone. You'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll be glad you are gone. You won't want to be here for the, literally the hell on earth that is here at that particular time. Now, with all that being said, you need to understand that I've taken you all the way to the time of the rapture and the tribulation with that little dissertation there, and that'll bring you up to this thing here in James chapter number 1, if you'll get that for me. James chapter 1. Now, this is Sunday school, S-C-H-O-O-L. That means it's time to learn a little something. Uh, and I don't mean to be arrogant or obnoxious or anything, but instead of just having your mind numb, watching images on a box or a little computer screen or a phone, you have to engage in order to get some of this. You have to plug in and think a little bit. All right, now here's what you want to get. Always in the Bible, you want to make sure that you understand context. Context. James chapter number 1, verse number 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to who? All right. Are you a tribe? Yes, sir. You're not in a tribe. No. The Bible teaches you in the mystery of the church that there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male nor female in the body of Christ. There's only Christians, right? right. All right. So if you're going to apply the book of James, you've got to realize that the book of James is written before the Pauline Revelation. 
You don't find references to Paul in here. You say, why? It is very strongly Jewish and it is applicable during a time called the tribulation period because you're going to see works that is connected with salvation. Revelation chapter number 12 and Revelation 14 and Revelation 20 teach you clearly. These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. Part of the requisition for you in the tribulation, not for you, but for people in the tribulation is, is they have to keep the commandments as part of their salvation. You don't have to be baptized in order to be saved. But they do. It's part of it. Now, I realize this is new for some of you, but just bear with me. Look in James chapter number 5. And pick it up, come all the way down, if you will, please, in verse number 7, because this is where it came up. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Well, if this is to a Jew in the tribulation, what coming would that be? The second coming. It would not be the rapture. All right? Behold, the husbandman, that's found over there in John 15, the husbandman, uh, it uh, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he hath received... Well, look what shows up there, if it isn't Joel 2, early and latter rains. That has to do with something going on in the nation of where? Israel. All right, pay attention now. Be also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. That's the second coming of Christ. Now watch, he'll say, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. Now you've already been snatched out. The door was open and closed, and now he's getting ready to come back a second time. You find that in Acts chapter 7 when the Lord's standing up there at Stephen's preaching. But not only that, ladies and gentlemen, notice that he says the word brethren. Well, if the brethren right there is the church age, then you've got a problem because you just put the church in the tribulation. So it can't be you. You say, why? It conflicts with Pauline doctrine. Pauline doctrine is you're not appointed to wrath. That's 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. That's solid in the Bible. So that's a doctrine. That's clear to you. James is writing about the second coming. Why? James knew nothing about the rapture of the church. It hadn't been revealed to Paul. You've got to get a hold of that. You say, why? The time of the writing is hugely important to understand contextually what he's writing about. He doesn't know anything about the Gentile being in the body. He doesn't know anything about us as a church calling each other brother and sister. He doesn't know that there's Jew and Gentile in one body. This is James Zebedee. You know what he knows? It's Israel, 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 Israel to the twelve tribes, what? Scattered abroad. To the far reaches of the earth where the heavens are, like the sister mentioned the other day. That means all the way out there on the horizon where the heaven meets the earth as far out as you could possibly go, the Jew has been scattered. That's who he's talking to here. Now notice what he says in verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, of patience. Well, look at that. Suffering and affliction. Are we dealing with the tribulation? Look who he picks out in verse number 11. Behold, we count it then happy, if you, which endure, remember endure to the end, the same shall be saved. You don't have to endure to the end. Watch it. You have heard of the patience of who? Well, you know who Job is. Job's a type picture of a, of a Jew in the tribulation period. Lays on his side for 42 months there, or he's sick for 42 months, loses his shirt, loses everything, and ends in the end of the chapter there, in chapter number 42, with the resurrection of his kids. Everything's given back to him. He's pointing to Job. As a matter of fact, if you go to verse 17 in the same passage, you see another guy there by the name of Elias, which is called Elijah. That's Elijah in the Old Testament. That's Jewish. Every bit of that's Jewish. Nothing to do with you in a church. You say, why? It's important for you to get the next thing. And have seen the end. Everywhere that end shows up in the Bible, you'll see generally a reference to the tribulation. The end of the tribulation. Sometimes it'll run all the way to the end of the millennium. Of the Lord, and the Lord is very pitiful and tender mercy above all things, my brethren. Who would the brethren be? Jews swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither things under, uh, under, neither by any other oath, but let yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. You know what he is saying there to you? He's saying there the same thing he said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. If you swear a thing or you say an oath, you better keep that oath or you'll fall into condemnation. Well, you can swear an oath now and not fall into condemnation. You can be called a liar or whatever, but 
Here it's counted as if you make an oath and you don't keep the oath, you're roasted. If you had salvation, you lost your salvation. All right, now here's where I wanted to get to, and this will hopefully answer some of your questions. Is there any among you afflicted? Somebody is sick, somebody is hurt, somebody has a disease and has a problem in the tribulation. Let him pray. Okay, good. First step that I do when I get sick, I can make a church age application. You need to pray before you call the doctor. You say, why? To know what doctor to call. <laughs> you sure don't call a dentist if you're having internal problems. You have gastrointestinal issues. You don't pick up the phone and call a brain surgeon. He'll say you need to have your brain examined after you get your gastroenterology taken care of, but you need somebody to take care of your tummy, your colon and your spleen, your gallbladder, your liver, all that stuff there. All right, now watch. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Here comes the healing passages. Let him call for the elders of the church. I just told you about the church. You say, but here's a church in the tribulation. Sure, there's a church in the tribulation. As a matter of fact, there's seven of them. They're listed in the book of Revelation. All those churches have existed. They're pictures of church ages now, but they will exist in the tribulation. Literally exist. Let him call for the elders of the church. That means he's too sick to get to church. Nowhere do you find anybody that is supposed to be able to come there to line up in a healing line. You call for the elders. Why? He's already prayed. He's already been to the doctor. And now he calls for somebody to come pray for him. Now in this day and age, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you go to the hospital. And I've gone to the hospital and I pray over somebody. I do not anoint them with oil. I pray over them and ask the Lord to have His will done. You say, why? Because I don't know what the Lord's doing. And I've seen them after that you know, go through all the process and go through a recovery process and they wind up, you know, getting healed back up and then they get up and you say, well, you know, the Lord, yeah, the Lord gave them the ability to get well, but they don't get healed immediately. And then I've seen some of them, the Lord heals them permanently. My dad would be a great illustration of that. Uh, Jim Lentz would be a great illustration of that. My mother-in-law would be a great illustration of that. Dr. Ruckman would be a great illustration of that. You pray and the Lord said, okay, I'll hear your prayer. I'm going to heal them now. <laughs> And they're all feeling better now than they've ever felt in their life. You see, sometimes death's a great thing to look for. Sometimes if you're suffering and your war slap out, you know, you've got no more gas in the tank, it's a blessing to be able to cut out from his life and be able to go to the other life. All right, now watch. He says, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, let me just clarify that right quick. Come over to Acts chapter number 10. The name of the Lord here is something that makes you a reference to the Jew. The name of the Lord. It's not the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at uh, Acts chapter number 10. Now so far everything I've showed you is pointed at who? The Jew. So now just because you saw the church show up in there, it doesn't change the context. Acts chapter number 10. Look if you will please in verse number, uh, let's see, pick it up in 45. And they of the circumcision, 1045... They of the circumcision. Who is that? Okay, which believe were astonished as many as came with who? Peter. Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see in that? They're astonished. Why? Because it was supposed to only be for Israel. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of what? The name of the Lord. The name of the Lord here to be the same thing as in Matthew. Leave your finger right there and come to Matthew chapter number 28. The name of the Lord is connected with the Jew. It's the name of Jesus Christ. You say, why? The name of the Lord is the only thing all three parts of the Trinity appear as. Jesus appears as the Lord, God appears as the Lord, and the Holy Ghost appears as the Lord. That's soteriology, but that, anyway. Come to, if you will, please, to Matthew chapter number 28. Now, you just had a, a Bible lesson there. That's why they want to take that stuff out of your Bible. You say, why? If they can demean the deity of Christ, they can bring your salvation into question. Don't ever listen to anybody, I mean anybody, I mean anybody that tries to divide the Trinity into three individual parts and make them individual persons. There's three different manifestations for the same person. 
That's God manifest in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ. It's not Jesus down here and He was born of a virgin, but after that He became all human. After, uh-uh, no sir. Acts 20, 28. That's God who says, be uh, careful to be the over, uh, God which made you the overseer which He hath purchased with, of the church which He hath purchased with His own blood. The only one that shed blood was Jesus. That has to be God manifest in the flesh, 1 John 4. You can't get it any other way. If it's anything else, then we all just as well shut the doors and go get a hamburger. Or a waffle or chicken waffle with some maple syrup or something. Anyway. All right, now, now watch what he does here. Verse number 16. The eleven disciples went to Galilee and to the mountain Jesus was appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake to them, And uh, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name. What would that name be? The Lord. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What would that name be? Baptizing them in, look at how it's written, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What is the name of the Father? It's Lord. What is the name of the Son? It's Lord. What is the name of the Holy Ghost? It's Lord, Acts chapter 10. The name of those three things, and look who it's connected with. It's connected with the baptism, and it's connected to the nation of Israel. Now, why do I point that out? Because when he tells you all the way back over in James chapter 5, he says, if there's anybody there that is sick, let him call for you, and you anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. So for the Jew, that would be the name of the Lord, and that would be in the name of, for the Jew, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's not three separate names. It's one name for all three. There's only one name that fits all three, and that's Lord. And you want to get that. You say, why? The Bible's written in such a fashion that you could sew that together if you'd take the time to study that. That's why when the Bible messes with that, when other people who have different versions, they don't even realize they've taken those references out. And you can't find that that's the Trinity. When they mess with the Trinity, they mess with a thing called the deity of Christ. The deity of Christ means that Jesus Christ is all God. Now, if you take that away, then you're going to have a real serious problem. I don't know why they feel that they're smarter than God to correct it. You say, well, they don't understand it. Okay, good. Then admit I don't understand it. I picked up a trigonometry book. I didn't understand anything about it. Well, I did the preface. (laughs) But other than that, I didn't get any of that other stuff. It doesn't mean they're wrong and I'm going to go correct it. I, I don't have the ability, the intelligence, I have not well enough studied in trigonometry to correct the people doing a trigonometry book. Well, imagine the audacity of a, quote, scholar to think that he has the ability to correct what God wrote. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. you got a passage over there in 1 John, I think it would be 1 John 2, and a big portion of that thing is written in italics because what I like about the King James translators was is that whenever there wasn't something in the text they were looking at in the manuscript, they would let you know right off the bat, we added this, this is us. This isn't in a text or presumed to be in a text. This is put together so that in English it makes sense. They put that thing in italics. And then about 50 or 60 years later, I need to look up the exact date, they found a manuscript with it and they found uh, found the exact wording that the translators had put in that same verse that they had written in italics. (laughs) They found a manuscript that backed it up. You say, well, you're saying it's uh, inspired. Well... (laughs) How could, you, how could you think otherwise? You'd say, well, you know, the Apocrypha was in it. No, it wasn't. Even King James had enough sense to say, this thing don't sound like the Bible at all. Put it between the Testaments. Don't make it a part of the old and don't make it a part of the new. It's not a part of your Bible. That's an old charlatan's trick. Well, King James, you know, it had the Apocrypha as a part of it. No, it didn't. No, it did not. It's inserted in the middle there. That stuff doesn't line up with any stuff in the Bible. Bell and the dragon and witchcraft and talking to dead people and necromancy, all kind of other stuff like that. It doesn't line up with any of the Bible. King James had enough sense, in spite of whatever you may think about him, doesn't make it matter anything. That Bible teaches you where the word of the king is, there's power. That came from England. That's where you get your time from. That's where you get your longitude and latitude from. You know how they find Jacksonville? Longitude and latitude. Where does it come from? England. Why? I got no idea except something to do with that book. You know where your time comes from? It comes from England. 
Why? You know, he's prejudiced. He's, why didn't he do it as Israel? Because he wanted it for English. Amen. Where the word of the king is, there's power. Amen. You have an English Bible. Amen. Now, imagine somebody thinking that they're smarter than those individuals to say, well, I, I believe God did, you know, send this book down here, but, you know, it's just an unusual. How come it is they're not always interested in correcting all the other literature? Amen. Take old Edgar, Adel, Edgar Allan Poe. That's a dark guy, man. You read that guy, you're ready to blow your brains out. But... Uh, Edgar Allan Poe. I don't see them editing his books. Right, that's good. You, ever, you ever read some of the, I don't know what authors you happen to read, but some of that, nobody's writing a new edition and then some author takes, uh, the, the, uh, uh, takes it upon themselves the authority to change and say what the author really meant to say was. Right, yeah. Right, yeah, that's good. You ever read Tom Sawyer? Yep. It's okay to say it in here. <laughs> oh, yes, that book has been banned. That's what great literary classic. You say, but it has stuff. It has stuff that applied at the time. Right. Yeah. Little brains about you, but I don't see somebody going in there and saying, you know, well, we need to change this to make it fit for our time. Come on. Yeah. But when it comes to the Bible, yeah. Yeah. they don't think anything about stepping in and saying, I have the authority to correct the author. They think the author of that book is the translators in 1611. Right. That ain't the author. Amen. The author is Jesus Christ in glory. That's just a printer. <laughs> That's all it is. It's just a, a Dell or a whatever, you, whatever printers are nowadays. I started to say a dot matrix. <laughs> Y'all don't even know what that is, do you? Used to when you'd run a teletype out, that thing goes, take 40 forevers. It's worse than dial up. All right, now watch. And the prayer of the faith, verse number uh, uh, 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Well, you've got to stop for a second there. <laughs> Salvation has nothing to do with an individual being saved as far as eternity is concerned. I'm in James 5. I'm in James 5. All right, the prayer of, the faith, of faith shall save the sick. Save doesn't always mean save in the sense of eternally. For instance, a lot of times when it comes to judgment in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, you have a judgment there that is pronounced upon your flesh. In Galatians, he'll tell you, they that sow the flesh, the flesh they are Romans, they shall reap corruption. That corruption is to your flesh. It's not eternal damnation. But you can get damnation to your physical body. Here, the saving is of the physical individual, not his soul. You say, why? Sickness was connected with sin in the Old Testament, connected with the nation of Israel in the New Testament when Jesus came. And in the tribulation, sickness is connected with sin. Notice what he says, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Well, isn't that something? So you get a faith healer that walks into the hospital room and he comes over there and he says, Dasha shantai untai bow tie economy Honda. And he makes a sign of a cross over you there with a little ball of oil, which if you go to the hospital very much, you see him walking around with a little ball of oil. One priest over at uh, the one downtown, he's got a little, little uh, container that he wears around his neck with his cross. I, I've thought some things sometimes and I, I see that fellow is kind of... I think to myself, have you changed your oil lately? But anyway, I... I I think those poor deluded people think that guy comes in there and he dumps that little bit of oil on them and puts that on there. I think to myself, they don't realize that's an ex, buddy. You just got cursed. They're trusting that guy to pray for them. Man, I got, I got news for you. I've run into all kind of nurses and stuff in there. They walk up. I don't know what it is. They walk up and say, you the preacher? I say, yes, ma'am. Good. Come on in here. Let's pray. <laughs> I've had them ask me to come pray for people I didn't even know. Come on in here, preacher. This guy needs some prayer. This is the preacher. He's going to pray for you. <laughs> they don't dare say anything. That's the nurse. I mean, she's the one that controls the meds, you know, to make you feel good before they're cutting on you. So it's like, okay, sister. They, but, but that guy walks in there with that air about him, you know, like he's going to do something special. Well, the Bible says that if their faith, if their prayer is there, this has nothing to do with faithful, faith, faith on the part of the person being healed. It has to do with the amount of faith of the one doing the healing. Yeah. If they don't get up, it's because you didn't have enough faith. How about that? Instead of putting it on the parishioner, Benny Hinn, instead of saying they didn't get up, it's your fault because, you, no, uh -uh, it's yours. You didn't have enough faith. But not only that, did you sit down with the person you're fixing to pray for and confess your faults to him? To tell him you're a human being just like he is? 
to tell him you got faults and cracks in you that could turn into sin just like he can? Did you let him know that you're no better than he is? The purpose of confessing your faults one to another is the elders are there and nobody is acting like they're any better than anybody. It's just I happen to be well and you happen to be sick, but don't let that fool you. I'm no better than you are. Amen. Confessing your faults. When's the last time you saw that in a healing line? Let's all pray here. A TK, tell me what your faults are. Brother Larry, tell me what your faults are. Brother Brad, tell me what your faults are. I'll tell you my faults and now the one that's uh, sick, you tell us what your faults are. How would you like to have that for a healing service? You know what most people say? <laughs> You're going to die, man. I'm not telling anybody my faults. That thing's been changed in all your new Bibles to sins. You say, why? To justify Roman Catholics and you going in and confessing your sins to the priest. That's not the context of the passage at all. The context is a Jew in the tribulation and Jewish elders of the church coming in there and when they get ready to pray, their faith makes the guy get up. Physically get up. And they anoint him with oil. That ties back to the Le book of Leviticus there. And they anoint him with that oil there. It's a type picture of the Holy Spirit. But before they do it, they all have to confess their faults one to another. Now, you want to believe in that stuff now? Well, then you have, that means when you get ready to pray for somebody, I'm not doing that. You say, what? I've been to many a hospital praying for somebody. I'll say, brother, let me tell you where I got some chinks in the armor, okay? <laughs> tell you what I'm dealing with. You see, the fault you're thinking about can be something as simple as uh, you feel bad because you have no results, lack of results. Mm -hmm. sure. You feel like a failure. See, it's not always something lascivious. Right. It can be pride and arrogance, that's true. But it can also be that, you know, I just always feel like I'm never accomplishing anything. I can be selfish. Yeah. Yeah. I can have self-pity. Yeah. Sure. You have to fill in the blank yourself. A fault is not a sin, but it has the potential to become one. Like the San Andreas fault, you have an area there that has the potential to crack open. They tell me there's a bunch of those things that run under Florida. I don't know if there is or not. <laughs> All right, now save there doesn't mean save in the sense of saving a soul. It has to do with saving the individual's physical health. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he had committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Are you with me so far? Why? Because sickness being remitted is the same to that Jew as sins being remitted. Now watch. Verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So that means the pressure's on the one doing the praying. How effectual is it? How fervent is it? Effectual means it has the ability to change the status quo. That's effective. Fervent, that's hot, boiling, that's, that's tremendous amount of heat. I've heard a few people pray like that every now and then on certain occasions. And man, you just feel like, man, I'm keep my face down. I'm not moving. I'm, um, you know, because they're connected up there in the throne room. And boy, they are pleading their guts out. I've seen some individuals going through some severe, severe withdrawals and some things and listen to them scream and holler and holler and rant and rave and, and that kind of a deal. And you're thinking, man, they are in trouble. It's like being pressed or squeezed like that. Uh, the Lord would be a great e example of that. He's there in uh, Gethsemane and he prays and when he prays, sweat drops of blood come out. That's called, uh, uh, it starts with an A, amatridrosis. Arma, I can't get the name right now, amatridrosis. But anyway, it's a physical disease that when you're under such stress and strain that where your sweat glands come out, you start producing blood. Not like blood, blood from the pressure that you're under. He prayed in great drops of blood. You say, why? He's in the wine press. That's the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man. You better believe he got through. Amen. You say, what happens? Boy, you better be grateful for that Father forgive them. They know not what they do. <laughs> you better be grateful for three greatest words you ever heard on Calvary's cross. It is finished. You better be grateful for that. You say, what? Right up there into glory, man. I mean, straight up. You better be glad. He's an effectual, fervent man. You say, what can he do? He can change the status quo. Amen. You know what he did? He shortened the distance between you and heaven. Amen. You say, what? Now you can enter the vestibule of glory by prayer. Amen. It's as close to you as a prayer. Yeah. 
That's how short the distance is. You say, what? There was such a great chasm between you and then there's no way you could get there. You could travel all day long, travel up a ladder and ladder and ladder through all eternity. You'd never even get to the door of glory up there. And because of what he did there on Calvary's cross, he shortened that distance to say, Lord, I want to be saved. And just like that, you're right in the door. Shorten that distance down. I mean, you, it's, so, it's thinner than a sheet of paper. Amen. Made it so simple. That's why, by the way, he was born in a barn. If he'd have been born in a castle, you'd have had to have an invitation to come to the birth. Yeah. He's born in a barn. Any animal can come in. There you go. <laughs> Who ain't welcome in a barn? There ain't somebody checking you know, stuff out there. You don't have a bouncer out there or somebody that's out there checking IDs and things like that to see how, how old you are and how young you are and all this kind of stuff. It's whosoever will. Let him come. What is it? Just a barn. Just a barn. What's in there? Well, all kind of stuff that smells and stinks, but there's a lamb in there I'd like to see. You talk about a petting zoo, Betty. That's a petting zoo. You say what? Little kids can walk in there and pet the, pet the lamb. Walk right up there. There's the lamb of God. And wrapped in the body of a human being. You say what? To shorten that distance. There's effectual fervent prayers right there. Right there. All right, let me give you a couple more things here so you get this thing out of the way. Now look who shows up again in verse 17. Elias was a man of subject like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. That's why when I told you, when they told him it didn't rain, I said it was three years, three and a half years, type picture of the tribulation. Somebody said, well, how do you know it's three and a half years? Right there. He tells you how long the space was. How long did it not rain? Three and a half years. And then when he shows up, he goes up there on Carmel and he prayed and again heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now again, brethren, fellow Jew in the tribulation, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. All right, well first and foremost, if you convert him, how do you convert him? It would be to get him to do good works. And how do you cover it? You don't tell them everything you know about them. You could cover a multitude of sins. I have friends of mine that cover a multitude of sins. They got amnesia. Didn't you know him back so-and-so? Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of dirt you got on him? Mm, don't have none. I got a friend like that. He's known me since birth. You know, when I met him, <clears throat> I met him when I was seven years of age. He fixed it and He covered it up so that no matter what I did, it would be covered from now on. Amen. And what's the great thing about Him is, is He don't tell nobody. Amen. He's a great friend. Amen. But I've had friends like that. And you say, what? You don't tell everything you know on everybody, do you? That's right. Just the ones you don't like. <laughs> Isn't that how you usually are? So the book of James, ladies and gentlemen, is written to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. And uh, when it comes there to the church, in that particular passage, he doesn't mean church in the sense of church like you. And the elders there are Jewish elders in the tribulation, and it has to do with healing. Now, I will suggest this to you when it comes to healing, and then we'll take a short break. Number one, pray. I don't care if it's a cold. I don't care if it's cancer. Pray. That's the first thing you want to do. Pray God will heal you. Pray God will get you well. Pray God will point you in the right direction of what you ought to do as far as taking medications or going to see whatever doctor or whoever, that kind of thing. Pray. Number two, Paul practiced it. Get a physician. Get you a good one. People say physicians are the devil and all that. Well, Paul doesn't have the devil with him like Jesus did then because Paul traveled with Luke. Paul never did get well. He suffered affliction the entire time of his ministry. Get a good doctor. You say, what? Sometimes a good doctor can alleviate the pain. You don't know what pain is until you've been with somebody that's in real pain. So be careful about making judgments about things. Especially when people start getting older, they start kind of having problems and things like that. And you get to thinking, you know what it's like. Well, you might be at 40 or something, but when you get on up a little bit, pain to you at 40 is different than pain at 60. And different at pain at 80. I'm not there yet, but I can tell already there's a huge shift in reality for me. 
All right, pray. Get you a good doctor. A doctor can help you. and Sometimes he can help to alleviate pain. Sometimes he can cure you or whatever disease you got. I recommend if you've got a bad disease or something like that, see somebody and get it and ask the Lord to help you with it. And if he chooses not to heal you up, then you have to live like the Apostle Paul did and say, well, his grace is sufficient for me. And so therefore, when I'm weak, he's strong. And if that's what God wants to do with me, my life's his and he can do what he wants. That's what the Apostle Paul did. Paul's the one that when he had that disease, wrote, I know that all things work together for good to them who love God. He's reminding himself. Paul said, I know how to be a base and how to bound. I'm learning to be content in whatsoever state I'm in. Paul, you can't have C. You're getting old. You're driving around with a doctor all the time. Yeah, he helps me out a little bit. He helps me have a, a relief from my physical pain. But Paul, here he is, an apostle. He can't even heal himself. You say, why? He's pointing you to the Gentile. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no promise for healing now. All the verses on healing have to do with the Jew and you may get healed and you may not. And if you do, you give God glory for it. I don't care if you say it came in the form of a pill or you went to see a doctor or you sat in a sweat box or you did whatever you did and you got well, you give God the glory for healing you up. He used human instrumentation to get you better. Uh, you go to the doctor. My father-in-law busted his hand open pretty good yesterday and go down to the hospital there and take that bandage off and look at it. It's got a good-sized tear in it. Your skin gets like cellophane when you get old. Got a big tear in it. You can tell by looking at it. He's going to have to have a few sit- stitches in there. I can imagine somebody saying to him, well, just trust God to heal it up. Well, that would mean the skin would come back together and it'd stop bleeding. We had enough sense to go to the hospital and let a doctor look at it and go, you probably need some stitches. Yep. <laughs> now, he might have been able to suck it up, you know, and take it and all that kind of a deal, but I'm thinking, where's the xylocaine? Mm-hmm. I mean, shoot that hand full so then you could hit him with a crowbar, <laughs> wouldn't bother him at all, and run five sutures through that thing and just heal him up and tape it up and all that other kind of stuff, and he's in the healing process now. He ain't all the way well. It's still busted. Right. It's just stitched. Take a little time to get well. But when he gets well, thank God for a doctor to go to. Amen. You say, why? If they get infected with somebody that age, it can be detrimental to their overall (laughs) well-being. You thank God for whatever healing you got. You go to the doctor and tell you you got cancer and you choose to go the route to have the thing treated and he gives you whatever it is they give you to help you to get better, up to and including surgery. You thank God for the healing. You say, why? Technology has progressed far enough along to enable you to enable you to have benefits of things you didn't have years ago. Don't mock and belittle all that kind of stuff and put all that stuff down. Thank God you haven't had to do that yet, but your day might be coming. They've got to shave your head and try to take something out of your head and things like that. You thank God you have the opportunity to do that. I'm not a drug addict. I don't believe in being a drug addict or nothing like that. But you thank God that you can take an aspirin or a pain pill or something like that if you've got severe pain. Thank God they got that ability to do that stuff. Amen. And you've been in the hospital and you've had heart troubles and things like that and they give you something to keep you pumping for a little while longer. Thank God for that, for the healing. He's allowed technology to... But this, this stuff in the pulpits going around nowadays where preachers are playing physician is wrong. I'm telling you right now it's wrong. Hawking stuff from the pulpit, including health food and things like that and telling people, oh, this, this, they have nothing to do with that. You might eat health food all your life and die of cancer. You might eat health food all your life. I've known people that run marathons, got something bad wrong with their ticker. Nobody ever picked it up at all. They're skinny as a rail. They got 3% body fat. Everything about them is absolutely running. Come in from running a marathon, 26 miles coming in to go grab a shower, going to have my green juice and stuff like that. Flop, fall over dead and die right there. There's no guarantees. You say what? Make sure your soul is saved and then do the best you can. You're a little bit overweight, okay, there's no guarantee it'll kill you, but it's better for you if you knock some of the weight off. It might cut your life or whatever, I don't know. But you thank God for those things. And then after you've done all that you can do, you accept the fact that, okay, I've done all I can do, so I'm just have to trust the Lord with it and live with it. Uh, Mrs. Salter comes to mind, and I never knew her, but I've, I've heard about her. She stayed over there, I think it was 30 years in a nursing home and uh, was completely paralyzed. They had to pick her up and put her down every day. Just no life at all. Fed her, you know, fed her, you know, put spoonfuls of food in her mouth. Lay there, they said in those days, they treated bed sores by putting Vaseline in the bed. Bring big jars, of gigantic jars of Vaseline and coat the sheets with it so she wouldn't stick to the sheets because her skin was so thin. 30 years she laid there like that. And the old preacher going there to visit her and say, Miss, Miss uh, Salter, tell me, tell me something. Let me hear you say, praise the Lord. She'd say, praise the Lord, preacher. 
learn to live with that day in and day out 24 hours a day 7 days a week Whew. man I don't I, but her attitude was I guess that's what the Lord wants I'm ringing her bell up in glory right now you say why it's a great illustration but, I, but let me give you just a little bit of word of a caution here and, and try to do it as gently as I can. If something has worked for you, unless you've been to school and you've become a medical doctor and can do that, be careful about just assuming that's going to work for everybody else. You say, why? Well, you don't ever know what you're conflicting things with. You're not well enough studied to think that if I take this, but if they're taking medicine, you can create major troubles. So, well, it's just a vitamin. Ah, be careful. You get somebody taking certain things. You ask these people in here, these nurses and physicians assistants and people like that, you be careful about that stuff. That's dangerous stuff you're messing around with. Now, I'm for the natural deal if you can do it and if it works for you, then good. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. But the bottom line is your wellness is in His hands. And if you're going to spend all your time eating sugar, then just reap what you sow. Enjoy it while you're young, kids. Well, after that, if you think about sugar, or even if you dream about it, you gain weight. <laughs> really, you dream about cupcakes, you wake up in the morning, hit the scale, you're two pounds heavier, and you're thinking, <laughs> I didn't even get to enjoy the taste. Yeah, but you dreamed about it. <laughs> and those pounds, they don't go away easy. So uh, you, you, you have to think about that. All right, I hope that clarifies that. Now, tonight I'll go over this other thing that has to do with uh, people going to the heart of the earth. And so that you understand that. Now, clearly understand this before we take a break. You don't go to the heart of the earth. If you're...